Okay, so um, yeah, I promise uh, cat pictures because, well, this is a slide that I, I constructed all by myself. Um, so um, what I want to do is uh, talk a bit about uh, some numbers uh, around uh, evergreen uh, productivity, um, you know, and you know, specifically in uh, the realm of uh, getting uh, commits, uh, implementing evergreen features, and documentation pushed uh, through uh, the process. So um, this is a bit more than an info dump. Uh, I do have a point uh, that I will be getting to uh, by the end, but the point is more about um, putting out some suggestions uh, about things we should be looking at, at um, recognizing that, that uh, we do have uh, certain uh, challenges um, that it would be good uh, for us to collectively surmount uh, to continue to make uh, evergreen yet uh, more awesome. Um, but I'm not uh, approaching this with uh, me ending up giving you anything more than a cat picture. Um, you know, no roadmaps, um, no firm conclusions yet. Um, but this is uh, something that I'm hoping uh, we all can work uh, together uh, to you know, deal with uh, the challenges I'm uh, going to talk about. Um, first, um, to give a bit of baseline for everything I'm going to show you, um, I Going to be showing you data gathered uh, from Git, um, um, specifically uh, the master branch uh, from the beginning, uh, at least as far as Git knows it, uh, back in 2005 uh, to when I uh, compiled most of the data a couple of days ago. Um, so during that time in the master branch, uh, there has been just shy of uh, 26,000 uh, distinct uh, commits uh, to Evergreen, where of course a commit is just a set of changes uh, to Evergreen's uh, files, be they code and or documentation. <coughs> as near as I can tell, um, now there may be a bit of a fuzziness, uh, plus or minus uh, two people. Um, the Evergreen commit uh, data in Git represents uh, contributions from, a 30, uh, from 132 distinct uh, individuals. Um, and you know, so you know, we should pause a moment to you know, recognize the achievement uh, that um, you know, since uh, the beginning um, you know, and about uh, 14 years, we've uh, done quite a bit of work. A number of people have uh, contributed um, this is no longer the Mike, Jason Etheridge, uh, and Bill Harrison uh, show. Um, now, when a couple caveats, um, I didn't draw in any data from Launchpad, um, but there is a trove of information on kind of the request and problem identification end that would very much uh, be worth looking at, uh, though one of the problems is that uh, Launchpad does not really led itself uh, to dumping everything uh, so that you can do detailed uh, data analysis. Um, and the Git activity does not include everything. Um, anything that doesn't, doesn't show up, up as, as a concrete, concrete file in our repository, you know, doesn't exist that you get. And with the specific uh, you know, things is there's a lot of uh, Git uh, dig activity that wasn't uh, reflected in this because their documentation writing writing uh, predated uh, their use of the Git. Uh, Git. Um, so, so, as um, you know, Andrea had uh, mentioned uh, while looking uh, over these uh, slides, there are very important uh, people in Evergreen's uh, uh, documentation history, like Karen Carlier who are not reflected simply because uh, all of their work uh, predated uh, the use of that gift. So those are copyets uh, aside, um, let's you know, move on uh, to uh, talking about uh, some of uh, the you know, numbers I've been able to grab. 
So commits uh, by year, you know, we, uh, of course, each commit is a unit of change or work. Uh, so, um, you know, if you look at the, the graph, you know, starting in 2005 and uh, particularly 2006, um, you can see that Bill, Mike, and Jason, I uh, did lots of the things. <laughs> Those are things evidently did not uh, include eating uh, or uh, sleeping, but, uh, you know, but, you know, one of the things, you know, that is important uh, to bear in mind is that um, small team-based projects can be incredibly uh, productive on uh, the coding net. But that level, that level, level for productivity, productivity um, as reflected like in, in the Git graph, is also deceptive in a sense that it does not, you know, uh, show the work of all the clients' library, librarians who were involved. It uh, doesn't show the work of everybody who participated uh, in uh, the road shows. Um, it uh, doesn't, uh, you know, show um, a, you know, a lot of things. But of course. It does also show one thing that is important to keep in mind, that if you give uh, a small group of uh, programmers a reasonably clear idea of uh, what they're supposed to write uh, and lock them in a room uh, for a few years, um, in terms of sheer pushing out of uh, patches and code, they can be incredibly productive. Um, they also, of course, uh, burn out uh, if you uh, keep them out lock in over too long. Um, but then, you know, what we see um, going from, you know, uh, you know, 2007 uh, to about uh, 2011 um, is another uh, expansion period uh, where, uh, in addition to, of course, for what, what happened, happened, happened after Pines Live, Live you, you also had uh, the early non-Pines uh, doctors, particularly uh, Laurentian uh, you know, University and uh, Scott's efforts as well as uh, the early Kent County Public Libraries and uh, BC Sitkas of the uh, world. Um, and one of the things to keep in mind there is, uh, in terms of people doing patch authorship, it uh, remained um, a relatively small group of uh, people. And then in 2012, uh, and you know, this is relatively um, you know, flat uh, sense of it, you reach uh, a point uh, where more people are involved uh, at all levels, doing code, writing documentation, doing bug reporting, uh, but the overall um, productivity if all you're measuring is commits, you know, stabilized uh, at about 1,000 commits uh, a year. Now, arguably, a lot of them are better at commits uh, in, you know, on an individual basis, you know, because of you know, things getting actually documented, there being more uh, review uh, before things uh, get in. But it does rec uh, you know, represent a distinct uh, change in uh, the pattern. So moving on to the next uh, graph. Um, so I take that back. Uh, there were clearly months uh, where um, you know, folks uh, did eat in their sleep. Um, <laughs> you know, but um, you know, one of the interesting things uh, is uh, that um, if you look at, uh, at it on a month basis uh, over the entire life of uh, the project, um, relatively speaking, everybody you know tends uh, to, I won't say take uh, October, November, and December off, but you know there are of course other you know competing priorities. So. Another thing to keep in mind, particularly when you're looking at uh, Git uh, logs, is there's a distinction uh, between a Git patch author, as Git understands it, and a, a commit. So the author is uh, the person you know, who, of course, writes uh, the patch. Uh, the committer is uh, the person uh, who ends up, in this case, merging that patch onto Evergreen's that master branch. Um, so, you know, if you look at the, the uh, commit authors, uh, you know, over the entire duration of uh, the project, um, you know, you see, of course, that Bill Bank uh, and uh, Jason Etheridge, you know, have uh, contributed uh, rather a lot, um, you know, both in general and specifically in terms 
of uh, you know patch authorship. Um, and then you know you have a distribution where you know that Scott B, Levius, uh, and uh, so on, where um, there's uh, you know kind of a drop off. Now that's sort of a thing you know you know you might know it as a prices law sort of a distribution uh, is not uncommon where at any given point in time, or if you look at things in the long run, you know you do have a long tail of uh, people making fewer contributions, important contributions nonetheless. But you know, if you look at the names, one thing I do want to call out is um, you know Kathy Nusir, uh is roughly here. Now, if you look at you know, you know her overall patch authorship was about one point two percent, but um, besides, of course, you know, calling out the, the obvious, um, you know, gender differences, um, you know, which, you know, is of course, you know, still a problem with respect to overall participation and representation in the project. Um, it does, you know, also um, point out something about um, longevity. I mean. Bill, Mike, and uh, Jason, uh, for uh, their sins, have uh, been working on Evergreen uh, for <laughs> almost uh, 15 years at uh, this uh, point. Um, now, this is uh, across all WACMED's uh, code and uh, documentation. If uh, we um, if uh, we look at uh, just everything in uh, the doc, uh, docs uh, folder, you know, as kind of a proxy for documentation. Um, we do see a similar distribution that uh, there's uh, definitely uh, you know some people, Jane and uh, Kathy in particular, who have done a big uh, chunk of uh, the work, uh, but also a you know relatively speaking, it's a more even uh, distribution. Um, and of course, part of it is you know and this is where you have to be careful uh, interpreting uh, the data. Um, I show up uh, as you know number three, but. You know, as everybody knows, I barely um, make any changes uh, at all uh, to the user manual. So most of my documentation uh, stuff has mostly been around um, dealing with the release nodes, writing some of them, but a lot more um, mechanical manipulation of them. So um, now, Going back to what I mentioned about there being kind of a big change around uh, the 2011-2012 time frame, um, back at uh, the very uh, beginning, three guys in a locked uh, room. Or at least I, I like to pretend that there was a locked uh, room, and I would be very distressed if any of the GPOS uh, folks uh, were to uh, shatter my illusion. Um, okay. <laughs> yeah. You know, so you know what uh, we're seeing uh, is that uh, you know you know uh, initial you know, stages, pine set goes, goes live. You know, then uh, the uh, you know initial expansion outside of uh, Georgia, and then uh, around uh, 2012, the project uh, hit. A relatively you know steady state of uh, you know between forty and fifty distinct uh, patch authors each year, um, you know on average, and you know staying relatively uh, stable. So, on the one hand, that's of course good um, because you know you know no uh, one group of people can uh, uh, you know can sustain evergreen uh, by itself, but um, you know if you dig into uh, the uh, list of people a little bit, you also see that uh, there's a fair amount of uh, people cycling in and out. Now, of course, some of that is just fine, because after all, people do have other jobs that they move to. Um, you know, every now and again, we send out emissaries who leave an Evergreen library and then spread uh, the news of uh, Evergreen uh, to uh, other libraries and so forth. Um, but you know there is of course you know a lot more churn. But you know one challenge right there is we're holding steady uh, at about fifty-ish uh, you know distinct uh, patch authors each year. Um, I would argue that would be healthy if uh, we could get to the point uh, where we can 
not only get to uh, an order of magnitude, you know, say around 100 people, but know, figure out how to uh, sustain it. Now, if we look at the committers, now, we, as a reminder, the committers are the people who are actually putting uh, the patches uh, into Evergreen. Um, you know, we have a similar uh, you know, pattern of, you know, initially three or four people at the beginning, uh, and then roughly 15, uh, you know, people uh, since uh, 2011. Now, one thing to keep in mind when interpreting this is the committers are largely the core committers, but not exclusively. And the reason for that is that the DIG folks have several people who can make commits directly into the docs directory. So committers in this sense is representing both core code committers and documentation committers. Um, but now let's look at uh, the past uh, four years. Now obviously 2019 is year uh, to date. Um, and this is the commits pushed uh, to master by each uh, committer um, you know, during uh, the course of uh, that year. So a, a couple patterns uh, we'll see. Three out of uh, the uh, four years, there's very much uh, a long tail distribution of three or four people doing most of uh, the uh, commits into master, uh, and then several other people doing some, ranging from some to a few. Um, 2018, however, is particularly interesting because they're at the top four uh, or five ish level, we have uh, more violence. So even though the graph uh, looks lower in 2018, in terms of overall number of commits pushed uh, that year, um, there were still uh, you know, uh, a bit under uh, a thousand. Um, 2019, uh, on the other hand, is kind of reflecting a trend that I hope doesn't uh, become a, a trend, um, because in this case, it's way unbalanced. Um, now, you do, by the nature of what uh, release managers uh, do, um, you know, folks who are acting as release manager are inherently going to be pushing a lot of uh, commits. Um, but in this case, you know, you know, it's quite clear who were uh, the two release managers uh, in uh, 2019. And I would argue it would be healthier if it wasn't necessarily quite uh, so uh, stark. So, you know, so we'll start off with a slightly disappointed uh, kitty. Um, <laughs> so, you know, we do have some uh, challenges. Um, one of the challenges is we do have a lot of patch review going on. And one of the things to acknowledge is that discussions about patches uh, are not um, entirely re uh, reflected in the, the Git uh, statistics. Um, if I had given myself a little more time, you know, it would have been interesting uh, to do some analysis of the sign-off lines in uh, the uh, commit messages. But that said, um, for the past um, you know year or so, we've consistently been running at uh, around between uh, 125 and 175 uh, patches with you know with a pull re uh, request uh, state, but not a sign-off uh, state for the entire year. Now, of course, the bug squashing windows and the uh, you know, feedback fest were in part uh, designed uh, to you know, help beat uh, back uh, those uh, queues, and they succeeded. But of course, the bug reports and uh, the you know, patches uh, keep uh, coming in. So, you know, more consistent uh, patch review would be a good to thing. Um, and another thing is that big features tend uh, to language. Um, and, you know, this may be, you know, a contribution of, you know, various, you know, things should be done to make it easier to review a big, uh, you know, features uh, or uh, there needs to somehow be more of a commitment uh, to do a review of a big features. But 
you know, there are at least uh, a dozen, you know, largish uh, features that have been sitting uh, with a pull request attack on them, but mostly not um, looked at uh, or moved uh, forward for longer than should have been uh, the case. Now, of course, there are a couple ways of uh, dealing with this. You know, we could say, okay, what are the things that are blocking people from having enough uh, time to review, um, you know, features? Are there incentives that we could change potentially at, at an individual or institutional level to make a review happen? Um, we also have options of uh, saying, okay, you know, take uh, the merge early and often approach, uh, which is uh, to do less of review upfront, um, you know, and proceed with uh, merging features as long as so they may meet uh, some basic requirements um, and then let the bugs uh, sort uh, themselves out. But of course, there's an obvious trade-off there that will that act testing actually happen before people you know, start upgrading. Um, so that's definitely a challenge uh, there. Um, another thing, and this is uh, particularly you know, directed at uh, the core code, uh, you know, code deck emitters, that um, Spreading out the committer workload and ideally doing having their in aggregate uh, be more work done would be a good uh, thing. So you know that's definitely something I'm interested in in terms of feedback. You know, particularly for the folks uh, who you know you know haven't been mer merging many patches. Um, are there things uh, that could be done to? give uh, folks more time to do it or more of an in inclination to do it. But we also have potentially more structural thing, things that you look at in terms of, you know, do we want to go down the, the road of um, designating more module maintainers? Um, do we want to, um, yeah, and this is uh, specifically uh, addressing the thing where a core committer is meant to have broad experience across a good chunk of uh, the code base, but maybe you know, encourage, uh, empowering folks who have more specific uh, experience to also merge patches within their domain of expertise might be a good. Um, sign off uh, practices uh, have uh, slipped uh, a bit. Um, we're no longer quite as uh, consistent uh, about uh, ensuring that there's always uh, and you know you know two levels of a review before a patch uh, gets submerged um, and that should be looked at now of course part of the answer might be anger uh, in terms of you know it's a technology that at the moment I think we have just four people actively doing significant anger uh, development at the moment and you know that of course means that there's potentially a you know, smaller pool of people who feel comfortable testing and evaluating anger patches. So that's uh, a concern. Uh, and also, you know, we uh, need to figure out what we can do to not rely so much on unicorns. And if we jump back uh, a bit, um, if we look at uh, 2016, 2017, and uh, 2018. Um, those uh, were three years um, where um, Kathy um, had, of course, done significant work, you know, in documentation and code, and of course, outreach uh, and you know, general catering for uh, the project. And then uh, she abandoned us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, you know, but of course, more seriously, you know, moved on uh, to a different uh, job for very good reasons. Uh, but you know, her departure has left a bit of a hole that we need uh, to fill. And ideally, in a way where we continue to recognize uh, the importance of individual contributions, but are not solely uh, dependent uh, on any one person at a time being the uh, unicorn. Uh, that's uh, holding uh, a lot of uh, the project up because, of course, that's, uh, among other things, an easy recipe uh, for burnout. You know, especially since we're talking about a project uh, where 
most of the people who are active in code and uh, development uh, are in one way or another paid to work on Evergreen, uh, although not exclusively. But um, there isn't necessarily universal institutional support uh, to for folks to be spending a great deal of time necessarily on community uh, commitments. So, you know, that's also something where, you know, that would be addressed to the managers of uh, the room of, you know, if you have, you know, if you are supporting your folks uh, in terms of doing evergreen community work, are you making sure that uh, they have the things like um, the tools that they need and, you know, you know, potentially the uninterrupted time uh, to do that uh, work, you know, so that the evergreen community work um, yeah, is allowed to be more than just kind of a weird side of project uh, that uh, your employees are doing. So, you know, some challenges, like I said, I am not coming here uh, bearing a roadmap uh, or easy answers, but uh, I did uh, want uh, to bring this up uh, for the consideration of uh, folks in this room and folks uh, outside that you know we have an opportunity to um, make uh, the leap uh, to the next level in terms of broader uh, contributions uh, to evergreen obviously we get more libraries using evergreen every year uh, we have more institutions uh, that are directly contributing um, and, and empowering their employees uh, to contribute. Um, but I'm also seeing some trends that, you know, I'm concerned about and think uh, we uh, should uh, reverse. So to, you know, so like I said, time to uh, make uh, a leap um, and, you know, but, you know, this is basically me asking uh, for uh, your ideas. So, uh, <laughs> I will happily uh, give anybody who asks uh, a little uh, mousy. <laughs> yeah, but not for a mousy. That, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's not, not uh, worth uh, the risk that you'd like to take. <laughs> so um, that's it in terms of uh, my presentation. Um, you know, if uh, folks have any immediate comments or feedback, I'd uh, love to hear it. Um, I, you know, I, I've, I've been sidetracked this last year for, for a lot, but I, did, I was surprised to see that I had as many questions as I have over the last year. But the um, the thing that gets me on some of the languishing bugs is I'll get to a point where I need someone to tell me, to explain to me what the problem is is that they're solving in a way that like if there's not a clear test case listed in the in the patch or in the you know in the feature branch or whatever it's very difficult for me to mock it up in a way that I would feel confident pushing someone else's work to address someone else's problem that didn't have to do with something we experienced at times. So I, I'm I, I look at those and I and, and I see those and I kind of step back. I'm I'm also I consider myself you know, relative newbie to the committer world, so I, I step back and sort of defer to the, you know, all their hands in this. But that may be a mistake. You know, maybe I should be more aggressive in saying, "Hey, what's this in the channel or whatever?" But I don't know. I mean, that's that's for some of the the feature branches that are kind of laying there. I, I get frustrated seeing those too because I, you know, for me, like project wide wise. Um, as I said yesterday, we're, we're in competition with all of the other proprietary analysis. The more features we can get in, the better, and especially if we're working on So, I don't know. I, my thoughts are kind of all over the place. But that's 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 where I, I land with some of the languishing bugs. Um, and I, I mean, I sometimes on a, a Saturday when I don't have anything else to do, we'll just be in volunteer, you know, project volunteer mode and want to work on a couple of bugs that are just kind of sitting there. But, uh, I don't know, maybe more concerted effort toward that. You know, I guess Bug Squash does some of that, but that's typically towards a release. Yeah, I, I was going to ask too, would it be helpful if we did more Bug Squashes per year? Would that be a little more focused? Or is there? I mean, I think last year, this year we've only done two. 
Yeah, I mean, my gut feeling is uh, that, um, you know, I think we do have the space uh, to do one or two more a year, uh, but, you know, we can't make, we can't, of course, make every week uh, bug squashing that week. Um, but I'm wondering if that's uh, something where maybe um, there's a, you know, some number crunching that we can do if, you know, we do manage uh, to get uh, data out of uh, Launchpad to do things like measure the impact of a bug squashing that week. Because I'm quite sure that a BSW or a feedback uh, fest does beat back uh, the uh, queue uh, for a period of uh, time. Yeah, I think uh, you know, the question is by how much and then how often can we repeat it before we start uh, getting uh, a, you know, diminishing uh, returns. Right. Another point about um, employers and their attitudes toward this, our boss actually has written into our job descriptions that community work is part of the job and it's a guideline that we've been given is 20%, which is basically a day a week. So that's, that's pretty oh, that's it's probably it's rare. difficult to get that yeah, unless we actually schedule something. Well, <laughs> but, but really, like, you, if you count the, you know, progress planning time and stuff like that, I mean, you know, it's it's all, it all gets in there. I mean, emails we're writing to the community or bug reports we're submitting on behalf of our, our members who find the problems, you know, that, that all, I think, counts. But, you know, if, if you are having trouble finding the time from your employer, which I think most of us probably aren't <clears throat> in this room, but... <clears throat> having having your employer understand the relationship and how important it is to be, so you can devote you know ten percent of your time at least to that, and not just have it be the Saturdays on you know when you're volunteer mode. Yeah, and it's like you know I would never want to discourage anybody from uh, saying you know I went to a couple of hours uh, you know closing evergreen uh, bugs uh, or. Um, you know, doing um, community at work. But of course, that's ultimately not uh, sustainable if that's the only thing. Right. Because, you know, I mean, the fact of the matter is, is if, say, we were running a open source project uh, for uh, a, a kick-ass uh, music uh, player or whatever, we would be getting a lot more drop by, uh, you know, drive uh, by uh, contributors, but also a lot more people willing to spend uh, their spare time. But no library catalog, uh, no matter how I kick ass, is going to be a mass uh, you know, interest uh, project in uh, quite that uh, same way. Yeah. On the most question, we, you know, scheduling like we do, kind of just had a thought just down when you were talking about it. Um, we, we put out a call for, you know, what do you want to have looked at on most question week, what do you want to have on the test machine? What if, it, what if it was just always a standing list that accumulated in between the bug collection weeks so we always had, you know, say a, a feature gets, gets sign off and that's like an automatic put to the list for the bug collection week or something like that that accumulates, accumulates a bigger list and then at some point we're like, all right, that's enough, let's do a week, you know, and that, now it's time to do a week. So it seems to me like it's the code that drives the uh, frequency of the close question more than the actual time of the year. It's like, how much do we have to test? And now it's time to test it, <laughs> you know, or something like that. Yeah, or maybe uh, maybe have, like, combine the two ideas, like have this close question weeks as is, but then also have, like, a running list of pull requests and then if we get to 10 or whatever, set that up so can somebody test these pull requests. Yeah, yeah. Prompt, uh, some sort of prompt might be just the thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sort of a more active, rather than assuming that oh, you know, what we're going to get to it, and everybody's sort of paying attention to the same thing. Maybe a, a prompt. Well, like the ACT um, interest group for a while. I don't know if y'all are doing this still, but was sending out a here's our bug of the month. You know, and, and that didn't always get a lot of movement, but I at least looked at it. I mean, it mm -hmm. got my attention on something. I might not look at otherwise. That's what I do now. Like for that kind of truth, I check any act bugs that have been touched like in the past month or whatever. And so like in our agenda, I just add it to the agenda. So are things that have been added or touched or whatever. So um, I think one of the one of the issues with asking for testers is so many of the people that can do the you know 
the like stack kind of testing especially don't have the ability to install the patches on the test server. So you know, if we had some sort of workflow where we could you know have a test community test server where we automatically apply certain yeah. patches and just tell people to test them. Right, kind of always. Yeah. 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 I mean, that's yeah. that's a lot of um, that work. Well, once yeah. you build the mechanism, it might not be that awful, though. Yeah, the container thing that I've got going for books, what <coughs> thing is, you know, once I have the commit hashes, just put them in the common and then they just, they're on there. And matter mm -hmm. Well, it's something to lower the burden of testing. Um, big features or things that touch a lot of areas because those are those are hard to test and complex and um, you know I think that they're probably a little daunting to, to review and, and to commit to which I'm sympathetic but something that would, that would lower that barrier as well. Of course, we also we already have an automated test master, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, you know, but of course, uh, the thing that with that is that you know it um, you know helps verify that we're not uh, breaking uh, the build. Uh, right. It's not something that uh, folks uh, can run into. Yeah, I mean now you know of course you know there's you know but the easy thing that would be saying okay here's a test system that gets refreshed periodically and just is always finding uh, the latest uh, master. Uh, as a way of saying that anybody who wants to dip in um, can do so, but that would be more along the lines of just overall integration testing or you know checking of core regressions. I mean, the thing where you know you can you know point at a bug and dial it up and get a test system uh, that uh, has it you know within 15 minutes you know. Get a test a system that has uh, that, that patch in that place. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, kind of, you know, the ongoing bug squashing. We, yeah, I think that definitely has a value as a something to uh, pursue. I was just going to follow up on Andrew's point about testing the big feature things. Mm -hmm. um, maybe integrating. Um, the lists more like as much as we try and get people to be on Launchpad, some of them aren't, and they're not watching that things are pull requested or that there's this big feature that has a branch now or whatever. And I wouldn't want to do that for every pull request because that would just flood the list. But like for a big like feature thing, mm -hmm. then just posting something to the list and saying like this is here, it's already on the server. Go look at it. Mm -hmm. So you're gonna do that? Yeah, definitely do right on it. <laughs> Okay, well, uh, thank you uh, for your time, and of course, this conversation needs uh, to continue. Thanks, Gil. Thanks, Gil. Thanks. Thanks.